Welcome back. I hope you had a nice break. You had a chance to have a cup of tea or coffee. I certainly did. And that you're ready to look at non-Newtonian materials. So the first question is, what is a non-Newtonian material, sir? And the answer is, it's written in the box. It should come as no surprise that a non-Newtonian material is defined as one where the shear rate is not directly proportional to the applied shear stress. In other words, it's not a Newtonian fluid, which is where the name comes from. If you look on the internet, you will see that there are thousands of rheological behaviours for non-Newtonian fluids, and you do not need to know them all. We are simply concerned with pharmaceutical materials, and so we are going to look at the three main types of behaviour that pharmaceutical materials show. By understanding these three, we can understand nearly all pharmaceutical materials we're going to come across. We don't need to overcomplicate by worrying about all the other types that apply to materials that are not pharmaceuticals. Okay? The three types that we need to worry about are plastic, pseudoplastic and dilatant. So by the end of the lecture, if you understand what that means, plastic, pseudoplastic and dilatant, then you're doing great. We will look at plastic, pseudoplastic and dilatant flow first, stop for yet another tea break, and when we come back again, we will look at the time dependency of those rheological behaviours. Right? So to start with, we're just going to look at the basic, um, the basic types of behaviours. <clears throat> now, before we look at anything uh, to do with the behaviours themselves, I just want to explain how we make these measurements in the laboratory. And I want to explain this because I feel that if you understand how we make these measurements, you can interpret the data a bit more easily. On the screen is a rheometer. It's the type of instrument that we have at the school that we use to measure samples for real. I think you might imagine, looking at that picture, it is way more complicated than a YouTube or falling sphere viscometer. So one question you could ask me is, why in the undergraduate practicals don't we use a rheometer, sir? Why are you making us use these funny bits of glassware? Uh, there are numerous answers to that, one of which is that uh, a rheometer is frighteningly expensive and therefore we don't want you breaking it. But another answer is that when you make the measurement yourself, you're really looking at uh, materials that are basically Newtonian fluids. And so when you use a falling sphere or a YouTube viscometer, you're not in control of what shear stress you're applying to your material. And it doesn't matter because whatever the shear stress you apply, the material will flow at, a co at some particular rate. And when you calculate the viscosity, it's constant. So it doesn't matter what shear stress you apply. You're not in control of it with those um, with those simple techniques. When we start looking at non-Newtonian materials, we do really have to understand how the viscosity is changing as a function of shear stress. And we can only do that with an instrument which is able to apply different shear stresses and measure the corresponding shear rates. And that's what the rheometer is doing. The way that it works is it, it, you place your material into a cup and, then, and the instrument has a ball or um, some other sort of probe that comes down. It touches the liquid and then the instrument starts to spin. So it will spin the probe. The, the faster it spins, the more um, force it's applying, and it's measuring the rate at which the material is moving in the cup. Okay. Now, on the screen in front of you is something that looks a little bit like an Egyptian pyramid. But the reason this graph is here is because when we look at some data in just a second, I need to be able to talk you through the data in order that you understand what's happening to the materials. And I feel it's kind of helpful to understand how the rheometer has applied stress to a material in order to interpret the graphs that are coming up. I want you to remember that when we make a measurement in um, any sort of instrument, not just a rheometer, but any sort of instrument, we have to start from a position where we load the sample into the instrument in the first place. And for a rheometer, that means that at the start of the measurement, no force is being applied to the material, and as a consequence, it's not moving. So the shear stress is zero, but the shear rate is also zero. So no stress, the material is not moving. Okay. When we look at the graphs in a minute, you're going to see that we're going to look at how, how a shear stress increases, how the rate is going to change. But I need you to remember that when we apply a stress to a material, we start from zero applied stress and we increase the stress that's being applied. The graph is meant to say, well, we, we might start to apply that increasing shear stress linearly. So we, we go up and then we come back down again. 
it doesn't really matter. We, we can apply it non-linearly, just makes the mathematics a bit more complicated. But I want you to remember that, that in the real measurement, we start with no applied stress, we increase that amount of shear stress and measure the corresponding rate, and then we have to remove the shear stress because we need to take the sample out of the instrument again. So it's got to go back to zero applied stress and zero movement so that we can remove the sample afterwards. And I feel it's much easier to interpret the graphs that are coming up if you remember that the instrument has to get to a particular applied stress by starting from zero and then remove that stress again afterwards. Right, with that out of the way, let's look at some actual rheological behaviour. On the screen in front of you is a graph for a material showing plastic or Bingham flow. I think you can see right from the start, it does not look like a Newtonian flow. Newtonian, remember, was a straight line, and this is very clearly a curve, so something different is going on. How should you interpret this type of graph? I think it's kind of helpful just to talk your way through the experiment, and in that way try and understand what the material is doing at each particular point. So if we start in the bottom left-hand corner, that would be a zero applied shear stress, and as a consequence, the material is not moving, so there's zero shear rate. So you're at the intersect between the y and the x axes. I hope you can see that as you start to increase the applied shear stress, so you start to go up the y axis, the material does not move. Okay, So there's no shear rate as you start to increase the shear stress. What does that mean? It means that as you're applying a force to a material, it's not actually flowing away from you. This is a plastic material. So if I go back to my earlier plastic material, which was my uh, tub of cream, what that would mean is if I start to apply a force with my finger, initially the material doesn't move. And so as I start to go up the y-axis, the material is not flowing. There's a, there's a very strong resistance to flow. But as I start to apply enough force, then the material starts to flow, and as a consequence, we start to see an increasing shear rate on the x-axis. So the way to think about plastic materials is actually think of them like uh, plastic materials. <laughs> so a plastic will resist flow up to a certain point, and then it will start to flow as the force exceeds um, the bonds that are holding the plastic together. Now, the point at which this material gives way and starts to move is called the yield value. You could, in principle, calculate the yield value as the first point at which the material starts to move, so the first deflection from the y-axis. But in practice, it's quite difficult to measure that, so it's much safer to extrapolate from the main line, just extrapolate all the way back to the y-axis, and we call that the yield value. So the yield value is really um, the minimum amount of force that's got to be applied to a plastic material in order to make it flow. Okay. One thing which is key then, if we're defining a plastic material, is if we measure its rheological properties, it must have a yield point. Okay, It's the key definition of a plastic material, it has a yield point. Right. What does it mean for the viscosity of our material um, if it's behaving in this way as shown on the screen? The viscosity, as I'm sure you remember, is calculated as the gradient of the line. Now, how do we calculate the gradient of the line in this case? Because we're going to get a different answer, aren't we, depending on which bit of the graph we calculate. The answer is we're going to get a different answer depending on which bit we calculate. So at the start, the gradient of the line is, um, well, at the start it's infinitely high. <laughs> As it starts to move, the material starts to move, the gradient is very high. And so if we were to calculate the gradient and hence the viscosity, we would see that the viscosity starts high. As we start to increase the amount of force that we're applying to that material, the line starts to flatten, the viscosity is getting lower. Okay, so I hope you can see that as you go across this line, starting on the left hand side and moving to the right, and you calculate the gradient, the gradient is constantly getting shallower, and that means the material is becoming thinner because its viscosity is decreasing. Hence, we refer to this type of material as a shear thinning material. You've applied some shear force and the material has got uh, less viscous, so it's become thinner. It's called a shear thinning material. Kind of key that, and we're going to come back to um, exactly what that means a little bit later on. So for now, remember, a plastic material 
won't flow when you start to apply a force to it. If you can overcome the yield value and you apply enough sh um, shear force, the material will start to flow. But as it flows, it starts to become thinner. And so the line is not uh, linear. And as we measure viscosity, it's constantly changing. And so what that means is we have to define under what conditions we're measuring the sample to be able to define an actual viscosity for it. Or another way of saying it is it's a material whose viscosity is constantly changing depending on the conditions that it is in. What sort of materials, from a pharmaceutical perspective at least, behave this way? So some examples are shown on the slide in front of you. It usually describes flocculated suspensions. Okay, uh, And the reason is because... Um, you've got to ask yourself the question, why does my material not flow in the first place? And the reason it doesn't flow is because it's going to have some sort of intermolecular or interparticulate bonding, which is holding the material quite rigid. So in the case of a flocculated sus suspension, as I said earlier, you've got a lot of polymer in the system and the polymer chains are entangled with each other. And so it can, it can create quite a thick uh, mixture, which initially won't flow when you apply a force to it. As you start to apply a force to it, you can overcome the strength of the interactions with the polymer chains. Then the material will start to flow because you're breaking those bonds apart. And so the system will change roughly from the image at the top, which shows you the polymer um, chains interlocked, to the image at the bottom, which shows the particles free to move independently. And I think you can imagine that if you were a particle in this system and you were stuck with lots of interpolymer bonds around you, you probably wouldn't flow very well. But as you break those bonds and you can start to move around, you're going to flow a lot better. And as a consequence, uh, the viscosity becomes lower because the particles are able to move more easily. It's one of those reasons why when we talked about suspensions earlier, adding polymers to a suspension is so important because you're changing the rheological properties and that changes the way that the patient interacts with the product. Okay. Next example on the screen is a pseudoplastic flow. Now, I fully accept that right now you are not an expert in looking at rheological behaviours. So you might say to me, hang on a minute, sir, this graph looks extremely similar to the graph that we've just looked at. Still looks like this, doesn't it? And I would say to you, excellent. For one thing, it means you're still awake and that's a really good thing. And the second thing is it means you're observant because the graphs do look similar, but they are in fact subtly different in one small way and that small difference is as soon as you start to apply a shear stress to a pseudo plastic material it starts to flow it doesn't matter how small the amount of forces you're applying it's still sufficient to cause the material to flow in other words the material itself doesn't have bonds intermolecular or interparticulate that are strong enough to resist an applied shear stress. So to go back to my plastic, imagine that I apply even a small force and the material starts to move. There's no resistance to that movement at the start. That's the only difference between plastic and pseudo plastic. So what that means is on the y axis of this graph, as you start to increase the shear stress and you go up the y axis, there's never a point when there's no shear rate. It's always starting to move. And so there is no yield value. So if you're looking at data, now, let's see, when are you going to look at data? In an exam question, that's when you might look at data. So if you're going to look at data or you're presented with data, just look and you think to yourself, right, I can see this is a shear thinning material. The only shear thinning behaviours we look at are plastic and pseudoplastic. So if you see it's shear thinning, it's definitely plastic or pseudoplastic. The only way to distinguish between those two is to say, is there a yield value or is there not? If there's a yield value, the material is uh, true plastic. And if there's no yield value, the material is pseudo plastic. Remember, pseudo plastic means plastic like. So that's why the graphs look rather similar. Other than that, the principle is the same. The graph looks like this. If we were to measure the viscosity, the gradient starts high. And the more shear that we add to the system, the flatter the gradient is becoming. And therefore, the more um, runny the material is becoming, the viscosity is reducing. OK, so in all cases, plastic or pseudo plastic, they are shear thinning materials. You apply a shear and the material gets thinner. Right? What sort of materials exhibit this type of flow? <laughs> very, very similar, really. Gums and pastes 
um, would do this. So again, a gum or a paste, um, it would have interlocked um, polymer networks, very similar to a flocculated suspension. And so it's the same deal. All you've got to do is overcome um, the interparticulate forces or it, um, intermolecular forces and the material will start to flow. Whether a material exhibits plastic or pseudoplastic flow simply comes down to what is the strength of the particle interaction at the start. With a flocculated suspension, you have at least got solid particles in there, and so there is the chance that it has a yield value. But with a gum or a paste, because it doesn't really have solid particles in it, it is quite a fluid material. It's more likely to be pseudoplastic. But really, either of those materials can be plastic or pseudoplastic, simply depending on uh, the strength of the forces holding it together at the start. So I hope you can see if the forces are quite strong, the material is going to exhibit a plastic behaviour because it's probably going to have a yield value. And if the forces are less strong, it's going to be pseudoplastic. Right? Now, on the screen in front of you shows you a dilatant flow. I know yet you're, yet you're still not an expert in uh, rheological behaviour, but I hope you can see that the dilatant flow graph is going in a different direction from a plastic and pseudoplastic. OK, so in this instance, it's more like this. Whereas plastic and pseudo plastic were more like that. Hmm, what does that mean? I know you're not experts, but just have a think about what that must mean for the material. Think about the viscosity. What do you think is happening to the viscosity? And to be fair, the answer is written on the screen, isn't it? So it shouldn't be too difficult for you to work it out. The gradient starts uh, flatter. And as we start to apply a shear to this material, the line is going like this. So actually the gradient in this case is starting to get steeper, isn't it? As we apply more and more stress, the gradient starts flatter and it starts to increase the gradient, which means the viscosity of our material is starting to increase. And so that means the material is thickening. OK, the material is thickening. It's kind of a weird concept, isn't it? You apply a force to a material forces energy right so you're applying an energy to a material you think that material would use that energy to break bonds and so it would get thinner and so plastic and pseudo plastic kind of makes sense you're you're disrupting a material and, and as a consequence it runs uh, better because it's thinner that makes sense but in this instance you're applying a force to a material and it's responding by getting thicker and that makes no sense whatsoever so there's two things i want to say about this one in an exam type situation and you're having trouble remembering what's a shear thinning, what's a shear thickening material, think about this. And this is an analogy I've given to students in the past. Imagine that you are nervous about turning up the exam. You're nervous about what the question is. You're nervous about whether you revise properly, things like that. Um, you are, in fact, experiencing a degree of shear stress because you're nervous about the, um, the exam. And then what happens is you go into the exam hall, you sit down, you open up the exam paper and you start looking at the questions. Oh, my goodness, the question that you're hoping that comes up, obviously, that's going to be a biology question, isn't there. Everything you've revised suddenly goes out of the window. In fact, you've forgotten everything that you were revising before you went to the exam. You have thickened. Therefore, a student going into an exam hall is an example of a sheer thickening material. As you uh, experience a sheer stress, you become thicker. So you are, in fact, a dilatant material. So that's one thing. If there is an exam question about dilatant materials, if it says, for instance, give an example of a material which is a dilatant material, I don't want you to do what one of the students did in last year's exam answers, which is the student wrote, I am an example of a sheer thickening material. OK, that was a good analogy and it was mildly funny and I enjoyed it. But it's not actually a pharmaceutical example of a sheer thickening material. So please don't write that in an exam, exam answer. Just um, just have a chuckle to it and use it as an aid memoir to remind yourself what a shear thickening material is. Uh, what I do want to do is give an example of what a shear thickening material is. And so one is shown on the screen. This type of flow is usually associated with really concentrated um, deflocculated suspensions and pastes. Why, I hear you ask? And the answer is kind of tricky. On the left hand side, of the screen, you can see what a deflocculated suspension or a paste would look like before you've applied any shear to it. So you've got lots of particles, kind of important this, it's a concentrated suspension. So you've got lots of particles 
uh, and they are surrounded by a continuous phase showing light blue in this instance and that continuous phase is acting like a lubricant imagine that you've got so many particles and they all want to shear past each other and they're aided in shearing past each other because the continuous phase is acting like a lubricant therefore when you start to apply um, a shear stress to that material the particles will glide over each other because the continuous phase is essentially lubricating the surface of each particle and the, and the material can flow it's a consequence of this type of material that when you start to apply a lot of shear force um, to a concentrated suspension the particles will start to clump together and in clumping together they then lose that lubrication so you can see on the right hand side those particles have come together and where they're touching it's particle against particle there's no continuous phase between them to lubricate and so because the particles have become less lubricated it's just harder for them to move around and so the material uh, gets thicker as you apply uh, force to it there are um, it's less common I think as a rheological behavior this but nonetheless it does happen in some instances and I've got some examples later on to show you real materials that behave with these types of principles okay right what does that mean it means we are at the end of part three so if you haven't done so already finish your current cup of tea get up walk around for a bit get the blood flowing back to your legs make a new drink come back again and we'll do the last part when we're looking at time dependency